feel yourself in the presence of God, the Supreme Being. Feel yourself in the presence of the Solar Being, all the High Beings, the Great White Brotherhood that we refer to, to Gautama Buddha, to Buddha Mailing. To our beloved teacher, Grand Master Chua Koksui, to all the teachers and masters of Theosophy, the beings of knowledge, light and power to our soul and divine self. We humbly invoke for your great, great blessings, for your divine guidance, for your light, for your love, for your mercy, for your guidance and divine protection. We humbly offer ourselves as instruments in your service. Help and guide us to have a deeper understanding and greater knowledge of your priceless teachings. We ask you to help us to be open and receptive to all this pearls of wisdom, to make it part of our lives and to become better divine instruments. We thank you in full faith. With gratitude, respect and love, we thank you. Atma Namaste everyone. Welcome to the study session and we'll move on to the second half of the fifth chapter. So that's what we're going to do at this point. So before we move ahead, uh, we will look at, uh, let's see if there's any questions written there. Can you send me the link of the Theosophy book? All right. Could someone send her the Theosophy book link that uh, you, you have the free version as well? and you have yeah. the paid version. If you could kindly put it on the chat for her, please. Thank you so much. Okay. So let's move on. I'm hoping everything will go well for you and for me. I have a question, Sumina. Yeah. I wrote here. I want to ask in first outpouring, as you told, higher soul is uh, in the higher mental body. And now, uh, higher soul has to wait for a soul from animal kingdom to me. But I want to ask that how did it started? Are you able to listen? Yes. Okay, I was asking how from the mineral soul the life started. We know that the outpouring has started till higher mental, but how did the first, I mean, how did the, how did mineral world came into existence and then, I mean, from, I mean how uh, is the energy in the mineral world there? I mean, how, from where did it come? Uh, were you there in the earlier sessions when we spoke about how it comes down and the different kingdoms were created? Yeah. So the divine spark is there till high mental level. That's first outpouring, right? No, that's what to you and me. Okay. We're talking about the outpouring, which is different from what we uh, spoke about earlier when we created, uh, when we were talking about the creation of the different uh, worlds. Remember, we spoke about the first elemental kingdom, the second elemental kingdom, the third elemental kingdom. Yeah, right. Yes. So that was the one that came this way. Then the mineral kingdom was here, half into the uh, inward and then the outward. Remember that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that U turn took place and then you continue with the mineral kingdom. Okay. And then you move further into what you and I call the uh, plant, animal, and then coming into human kingdom. But from the, from the human kingdom, sorry, from the animal kingdom to jump into the human kingdom, the group soul has to become individualized. And that's yeah. when we were talking about, you know, we're getting the energy down, which comes to from the, uh, till the higher mental. And then there has to be a response at this point. And then one of those fragments will come down as uh, the higher soul incarnating with a body with a human body yeah thank you you're most welcome uh, yes. is, is kundalini energy a remnant of the first outpouring is it from the first outpouring i'm sure it has something to do with matter uh, because the kundalini is associated with uh, the shakti or the mula prakruti or what we call uh, mother nature or the earth and so anything to do with form is con uh, connected to the kundalini now exactly how is it connected till date 
Um, I'm not sure I've read anything anywhere that mentions that, but I know definitely just like we have the upper rooting, the upper rooting is towards uh, our father aspect and the lower rooting is towards the mother aspect. And the Kundalini is connected to the lower rooting, uh, connected to the mother, yes, and to the form aspect, right? And so uh, since we're talking about the outpourings actually creating form out of matter, which is much more subtle than what you and I call matter, uh, it, there would be definitely a connection with that. But how far does it go? I've not read yet. Yeah, Dr. Sagar? Yeah, thanks. Uh, and can I ask a second question? Sure. Uh, if we know that uh, finally the mental body has to be shed, and because it doesn't matter at the level of... Uh, you mean shed? Uh, it has to be shed? It, it has to be removed at the... At the like, as we as a human life evolves, the mental body is yes. able to share. Yes, yes. And then this mental body does not exist at the at the monadic level or, or higher. So how does the development of the mental body contributes in the divine plan? Like whatever mental body a human develops, how does it help in the divine plan? All right. Uh, so maybe some of the things that I'm going to talk about now uh, will hopefully help answer some of your questions with reference to the mental body, because part of what we're going to talk about today is the mental body. Yeah. If it still doesn't answer it at that point, please ask this question again, Dr. Sagar. I'll go back to it. Thank you. Yes. All right. So let's move on. Uh, so we stopped yesterday with reference. Where is that line? Yes, uh, we spoke about different emotions having different colors and the effect on, on the physical body, right? So uh, we spoke about the mental body ha being basically the upper and the middle, sorry, upper and the lower, the upper mental level associated with what we call the higher mental world or the higher mental body. And we found that the lower four are what we call the low mental world, yes? And so uh, keeping that in mind, the size and the shape of your mental body and my mental body is determined by certain factors. And so let me share that with you at this point before we go ahead. Can you see this? Is it all visible? Yeah, okay. So when you look at the mental body or the mental vehicle, as they call it in theosophy, there is a certain size and shape to it. Now, the size is determined by the causal body, the influence, of course, of our causal body. But beyond that, within your mental body are what you call striations. Yes, uh, so they are like markings and they are div divided inside your mental body and they're not very regular segments. It's not like a perfect square or a circle or anything of that sort. It's just irregular shapes. However, within those shapes that are created within the mental body, you have what is called correspondence to our brain. Remember when we spoke about the mental body, we said the mental body, yes, is created with matter, but it also helps create your mind. And the mind, the instrument that the mind uses is the brain as well, right? And so there is a corresponding relation between a segment or one, one section of this uh, mental body in relation to you uh, departments or sections in our brain, right? And so any thought about a certain aspect, that thought can only function in that segment or that section of the brain and in the mental body. It cannot actually move out. Yes. So uh, when we look at what's mentioned here, give me a second. Let me just move this down. Because I can't see what I've written there. That's why. Okay. So when you look at it, you have these irregular shapes within your mental body. And then based on the kind of thought you have, those thoughts can only relate to that section of the irregular form. It cannot move to any other section. So each department in your brain, whether, whether it's a speech department, whether it's a movement department, whatever departments are there, they're all connected to a certain irregular form within your mental body. Yes. So when you look at an ordinary man, 
and if he has a certain thought in the mental body and wants to pass it towards the brain interestingly on the way what happens is uh, oh, sorry on the way what happens is while this message is trying to come from the mental vehicle into the brain it has certain other barriers on the way and so what happens is while this is coming towards him it starts to go into what we call inappropriate channels and therefore by the time it reaches his brain it doesn't make any sense all right so that's one of the reasons why sometimes in ordinary uh, people you'll find that one takes to maths very easily whereas another one cannot make sense of a plus b the whole squared yes one is able to take on music but the other one has no idea about tones or sounds or even anything to do with the way it's supposed to be uh, sung or even played and so they say that this has got to do with how these departments from the uh, from the mental body come towards the brain of a person during that remember we have our mental body we have our astral body we have the etheric body and then we have what is called our physical body and the brain that we use is inside this body so for the communication to come from the mental segment through the astral through your etheric and into your brain should be absolutely clear and the communication lines or the the movement lines should be open yes now in this case uh, when when it comes from the mental body for an ordinary person the channel through which it has to go are sometimes inappropriate even though they are open channels and so by the time it goes through all those channels and comes to the brain it doesn't make any sense to them and so even if you repeat yourself it does it just doesn't go through effectively into the person's brain however when uh, when you look at a person who's far more developed then that information which is mentioned here as in each of your uh, in each of the mental bodies there are what you call irregular segments yes these are divided into different uh, segments in your mental body and corresponds to certain departments in your physical brain however for this to function properly yes uh, every type of thought should function thoroughly in its duly assigned portion and so it says the mental body of a uh, ordinary person is imperfectly developed and so when the information from that uh, mental body tries to come through because the departments are not very active as well on the way it goes through what is called inappropriate channels even though they are fully open and so when the thought comes it's a very clumsy uncomprehensive thought yes uh, but when you start to develop more and more this mental body also becomes stronger the information from that uh, segment coming through your respective bodies finds direct channels coming straight to your brain and you get the information really quickly but as long as the so called body of the uh, ordinary person is not as uh, they call it imperfectly imperfectly de developed that causes a problem for them and so one of the reasons why you want to develop the mental body so let's go on to the mental body a little bit more so the matter in the mental body all matter uh, should actually be moving and circulating within the physical uh, within the um, mental body just like we talk about prana that needs to circulate all through our system similarly even in the mental body the mental vehicle the matter should be freely moving and circulating however what does happen uh, quite often is this so what happens in the mental body you have a particular thought and that thought tends to suddenly become solid yes and when it becomes solid it does not move any more and therefore obviously circulation is affected but what happens is this solidification this congestion in that part starts to harden and they talk about it as being something like a watt you know like a watt on the physical body and for example it could be for example this uh, thought could be that of prejudice and so when that hardens and goes and stays in that part of your mental body it no longer allows proper circulation which is required for the mental body right and so since they have this prejudice yes this is hardened energy in their mental body 
that person with reference to that department where the prejudice is at this point cannot think clearly in that area right now now let's take the, take an example now very commonly uh, say for example you hear about a from uh, mr z and he says you know this person is like this or uh, uh, you have to be very careful about the way they think about the the things that you say to them because they start telling stories they start um, you know manipulating information and so when you meet this person a you have already a thought created within your mind about him or her yes now if it's just a, a very you know in passing it comes that thought is not very strong that you have created for yourself in your mental body but if you have heard it from z and if you heard it from mr q and miss uh, x all this information that comes and their thought further increases the thought that you already have it gets fed into it and it becomes a big huge thought and you can then only see this person through the light or the eyes of all these three other people who spoke to you you haven't therefore even taken what you would call uh, weighing or balancing what they have said and what have you experienced to then gauge this person you start to look at this person purely because of what you already have heard and therefore you've created a thought or a prejudice towards that person and so you can't see that person in any other way but that way yes now this could also be with reference to say certain beliefs that you have your belief is so strong from the time you're a child that you believe that this is the only way to do it and this is the only right way to do it and so when anyone else talks about it you are so strong about it that you won't let it change and so your point of view becomes what you call uh, hardened yes you do not become flexible even in your thought and that can happen and in that area that man can never see things clearly however at work he is very very flexible you know with the plans with how to implement it no problem in that department no problem you talk to him about this belief of his that's it you you've struck a stone and it's not going to budge yes and so that is something that does happen in our mental body so we have to be aware of that let's move on and so it also talks about how man can use any part of your mental body all right now say for example you're trying to use one particular part of your mental body and uh, this is towards um, say research yes scientific research that you are interested in and so you start to use this part once you start using a certain part or a certain department uh, or a certain segment in your mental body that part of your mental body starts to vibrate yes really rapidly so the vibrations or the undulations that we were talking about earlier starts to increase temporarily yes and slowly it also starts to swell up so if you look at that part of your aura you'll notice that that part of your mental aura is vibrating faster very rapidly and slowly it starts to swell out so there's a swelling as well temporarily created in that part now if your research continues yes it's not just a thought in your mind you know that you want to do this but you actually want to go deep into research you actually find everything that is required your plan is starting to function and day in and day out you're working towards that plan then in your mental body because the thought is so uh, consistent it's been prolonged for a very very long time sometimes 2 3 years then at that point it starts to change now we're not talking about the hardened aspect anymore when you start to have prolonged thought it increases again the vibration yes and the swelling and it becomes permanent now you have to figure out whether that thought you have is one that is desirable one that is good for you or is it something that's not good for you that's something we have to be aware of yes so whatever thought you start creating whatever thought you start to mull over and you repeat in your brain over and over again starts to have its effect on your mental body yes and so you and i have to try and figure out what do i want to create on a regular basis what kind of thoughts yes in the mental body has its segments which are very irregular it has a correspondence to my brain now we realize that when my mental body continues to think about a certain thing the vibration increases there's a swelling 
However, if my thoughts are persistent, yes, it's prolonged, then that becomes permanent. And the connection towards my brain, it has a direct access and it starts to influence the way you think. Now, the thinking, you need to figure out whether it's a positive one. Yes, the thought that you're talking about, or is it a negative one? That is something you have to be aware of. Now, keeping Master Chua's teachings, I would also say, are the thoughts about yourself? Are the thoughts about others? The second category there is the thoughts are positive or negative towards others, positive or negative towards myself. And so if you have a hardened thought that is not very positive to, towards yourself, that would be very difficult for you to break. Yes, we're talking about ordinary people. We're not talking about pranic healers. You and I now know what we can do. So this is what happens with reference to your mental body. Yeah. So let's move on uh, a little bit more further than this yeah now when you have what is called a thought like i said it can be positive or negative or uh, in the book it says good and bad now when you have a particular thought that is good when it starts to vibrate when it has its impact now what does it do from where it is wherever it is created if it is a good thought it starts to gravitate towards the upper part of your aura and so if you have more and more positive thoughts in your life, then if you look at the egg with a blue background, it starts to move around the upper part of your mental body. Yes. And so uh, say, for example, you have thoughts of love and devotion and service more regularly. And these are the thoughts created. Then it gravitates automatically to the upper part of your mental body allowing that part of your mental body to swell up there. You get what I'm saying? Whereas the lower part, because your vibration to lower and lower thoughts are not so much, it tends to be more tapering. So it looks like an egg where the upper part is wider. However, if your thoughts are negative, yes, uh, where you feel uh, thoughts of envy, uh, selfishness, where you're constantly irritable and angry, then what happens is those thoughts gravitate towards the lower part of your aura, like here. And so the lower part of your mental body starts to swell up. And you want to figure out which one you want to have in your life. Yes. And so very simply put, your shape of the mental aura or the mental body changes based on the kind of thoughts you create on a regular basis. Now, yes, uh, you could be a nice person, but you get angry on and off. It's okay. Then your upper or upper part of that mental body will still be wide. But if you're constantly annoyed, angry, irritable, uh, you know, finding fault with people, then the lower part tends to become bigger. The upper part tapers. And so you want to work towards, obviously, increasing more positive thoughts within your system. Yes. Now, all the bodies that you and I have, um, starting from uh, the etheric body. So if you look at the outer aura that we talk about in pranic healing, it's also ovoid. Yes, it's like an egg shape. The same is with the astral body and the mental body. And so these bodies are more or less like that. But depending on the kind of vibrations or the undulations that you create within it, it tends to have a different uh, shape. Uh, basically, the, the uh, thickness or the swelling either on top or below. And so it says, um, so what they want you, want you and I to do is start devoting ourselves to thoughts of uh, higher ones, which tend to then move towards your upper part of the mental body. Now the study of colors, we're not just talking about only uh, the thought form, the study of the colors is also interesting because <clears throat> if a person clairvoyantly looks into uh, your, your mental, mental body and tries to see, uh, based on the striations, the different segments, they can actually perceive whether the person has had more positive thoughts, negative thoughts, one, because of the shape. Secondly, also the segments that are swelling up. So they can actually try and figure out the character and your progress from the time you came into this present life. So not just this lifetime alone, they can actually look back at all your lifetimes to say, how have you mentally developed? 
Yes, and so the swelling in these segments uh, between the striations are the ones that they start looking to, especially see if you are progressing mentally, even if you are a spiritual aspirant. And so the similar feature is also available in the causal body, right? And so the causal body can also see, you can also see the progress of the ego, that is the higher soul. So when you look at the causal body, uh, you will also notice how has this higher soul actually progressed? Yes, and so sometimes great teachers uh, will start to look beyond the physical body of their students to see how they have been practicing, especially I think with Master Choa, because he saw us only once or twice a year. I'm sure he was checking out more than just the, uh, the 12th chakra when he would see us. So when, when we would sit at a dining area with Master Chua, he would never look at you at the face. He would be looking above. And I'm like wondering, oops, I hope it's okay. Because the last time he probably looked into it deeply was one year ago. And I'm hoping in one year I've improved a little bit and not gone backwards. So to keep, uh, to continue. So when you and I have a thought, um, now, since I had trouble with my laptop, I'm not sure if I was able to continue with the work here. Let me see if it's there. Okay, uh, I think this is probably my last slide. After this, my laptop just disappeared. All right, so the mental body, coming back to our mental body. So when you and I have thoughts, yes, that is when, when man thinks, man being uh, male and female here, basically they talk about, in theosophy, a tiny image is created. Yes, just a tiny image and that floats around somewhere near your eye, yeah, at the level of your eye. Now, this thought that you have, say, for example, it's a thought about, uh, say, for example, my thought is about uh, Acharya uh, faith, for example. Yes, and the thought is, you know, it's just a thought. There's no emotion connected to it. It's just a thought that, yes, this is how uh, master faith is. There's not, no emotion, no memory, nothing connected to it. Now, in this case, it does not go towards that person. It does not affect that person at all because it's just a thought. It just stays there, right? However, when the thought is uh, also with emotions, yes? So you have a thought attached with emotions to it, which means it's not just matter from the mental body, which is usually what a thought is. It also has matter from the astral body which becomes what is called an astromental form, this then jumps out of, your, out of your system and starts moving towards the person or the object it was meant for. Right? And that's why Master Choi, even in Pranic Psychotherapy, says you can have thoughts and emotions, but it's very rare to have an emotion without a thought. But you can have pure thoughts without anything with it. Now, if it's a pure thought, for example, uh, um, a scientist who has a thought about what he's creating or what he's doing, it's just a thought. There are no emotions associated with it. So it just stays there, probably just floating in his aura. Now, however, if he doesn't like, you know, a particular person in his department, as soon as he sees that person, there's a thought towards that person, but there's emotion also attached to it. As soon as there are emotions attached to it, then it jumps out of his aura and goes towards that person. <clears throat> yes, and... We have to be aware of the kind of uh, thoughts we are trying to project out there. So what happens is once it reaches that person or that object, then the thought form that you created then releases itself. The word that they use in the book is called discharges. So it releases itself out into, depending on the material, the matter, into the mental and the astral body of the object. Now, say for example, it's love, then amazing. Right, so say you're, you are the creator of that thought of love towards your loved one. So even though the person may not be in the same uh, city, may not be even in the same country, but far away, your thought that you have, that you create of love towards say A, will then have mental matter and astral matter together. And then since it's targeted towards only A, it cannot go to B, it cannot go to C. Even if A, C and B come in the way, it doesn't matter. It will go straight towards A. And when it then releases itself inside the aura of A, it then within him evokes the emotion of love. Right? And sometimes they might even sense it's from you. And so the love within them evoked will be then responding to what you have sent to them. Yes? So this is basically with reference to uh, the mental body. 
I think that's my last slide. Yes, <laughs> I thought as much. So I'm sorry about that. With that, we have to go back. Okay. So to move on, uh, let me just get back to a couple of things. Okay. So if you look at it, what Masacho talks about, when you and I are there in our waking consciousness, we are constantly creating thoughts. Maybe just pure thoughts with mental matter or thoughts with emotions. And so from your mental or the astro mental level, you're constantly sending out a train of thoughts. So whether you're sitting, whether you're walking, it's like behind you, there are all these thoughts that you're constantly you know, releasing out of your aura. And so they say that when we go walking, say into a mall or on the streets of your city, you are actually walking through a sea of thoughts, a sea of thought forms. Now, how many positive, how many negative, we do not know. Yes. And uh, so when you go through it, it's, it's like um, when you talk about egrego, right? So say, for, for example, right now, the egrego is uh, about the COVID-19. So regardless of where you walk, People are thinking about it. People are um, sending uh, thought forms about it, positive, negative, their, their own opinions, what they've heard. So there is a huge thought form of the COVID-19, not just here, but all over the globe. Yes. And so that is definitely a very, very strong thought form that's been created right now. So you, they say, are walking amidst a sea of other people's thoughts. And so sometimes... Uh, what happens is sometimes one might attract the attention of a certain uh, thought which, which, which is there because of your own kind of uh, mindset at that point. And then what happens is uh, when there is a thought and you also have a similar thought, they kind of attach themselves and that thought can become even stronger. And then that becomes strong enough to then act upon if necessary. So they say here... <clears throat> Sometimes one arrives, which attracts his attention. That's the attention of another. So that his mind seizes upon it and makes it his own. So even though that thought wasn't yours, because you're walking, that thought is there. And then you kind of, when you take it in, then it becomes yours as well, because you're going to work on it. So what happens is he makes that thought his own, strengthens it by adding his own, his own uh, input or opinion onto it, and then casts it out again. Right. And so they say he is not responsible for any thought that is floating around. But if you take that thought as your own or attach it to your own thought, give it further more information or your own opinion and send it out of your aura, then you become responsible for that thought. Yes. So, yes, you and I do create thoughts on our own, but sometimes the thoughts that are floating around us, sometimes you take it on as your own. And when you take it on, or on as your own and you add to it and then release it out of, your, out of your system, then they say you become responsible for that. And so he is responsible if he takes it up, dwells upon it, and then sends it out strengthened. Yep, so something to think about because I think we do this. We hear about something that someone said about a person specially Gossip is something that people enjoy. And then they decide, you know what? This is not enough. I'll add my own masala and then I will transfer this information to someone else. And there it goes. So when you do that, you're responsible. Now, it's also both for good and bad. It, it, this, this example I gave is gossip, but it can happen for good and bad. Anyway, so let me go. Now, if you have what is called a self-centered thought, yes? Uh, and the kind that hangs around the thinker, they say that the mental body will then have a shell around itself. So when it's self-centered, you automatically create like a shield of thought around. And uh, obviously because of that, you become prejudiced about man many things or various things. You do not allow other people's opinion, other people's thoughts to come in because you have already decided this is how it is. Yes, and you create a shield around yourself. And so they said, its tendency is always to reproduce its own rate of vibration in the mental body 
upon which it is fastened. So they say that, uh, now this is with reference to thoughts that are coming from outside, yes? And when they want to influence, if you've, if you've got your own barrier, it cannot come in. But anyway, if it does, if it does come in, when it comes in, it's going to try and find similar vibrations or similar <clears throat> undulations within you so it can then stay and become part of your thought form or your process of creating thoughts. Yes. And so that's why <clears throat> when you go out, you have to be careful and you have to wonder when you come back home, are all the thoughts you have right now yours? Or is it because of the, you know, the movie you watched and the movie makers thought coming through the movie is what you take back home? Yes. You watch the news and what the news reader mentions on the news, is that what you take on as your own? Or do you use your discernment? Do you use your brain, your mind, your intelligence to further figure out, hey, is this right or is this wrong? Is there more to what I am hearing or do I just accept it? That is when we talk about being gullible. You do not use discernment. You do not ask questions. You just take it on uh, as the truth, even if it requires questioning, just because sometimes you trust the person. Yes. And uh, so <clears throat> to move on, um, the self-centered thoughts that you create also has the same effect. So you create your own thought. Yes, not very positive. And then it's hovering around you. You've put a shell, so it obviously can't go. It comes back and it discharges itself onto you. And you think you've been tempted by the devil, by the demon, yes, or by that uh, entity. But it's your own thought <laughs> that is now attacking you. It's not somebody else's. No one else has sent you the thoughts. It's the way you've been thinking that has actually gone, yes, as a thought, and then comes back and discharges itself on you, further affecting the way you think. In this case, about yourself or about the matter that you have about yourself or in a certain situation, uh, maybe something you're creating. Yes. And so it says he generally regards it as a suggestion of a tempting demon, whereas in truth, he tempts himself. <laughs> yes. So uh, you don't have to have a demon out there coming and trying to tempt you to do bad things. It, you have to remember that probably at some point you created this thought that is just bouncing back at you. The problem is when we become very emotional and very negative, can you imagine what you actually create within your own aura? And it might look so strange and so crazy. So I think sometimes when people uh, represent monsters in, in, uh, you know, in children books, <clears throat> in, in story tales and story books that you read, the creation of, say for example, Beauty and the Beast, I don't think the beast was actually a beast. It's just that the characteristics in that human being at that point had gone to such an extent that it was almost animalistic. And so the representation maybe of the aura of someone like that probably looked like a beast, but it's not necessarily only the physical form. It might have to do with what you and I create. Yes, we create in this case, just like these thoughts tempt us and we are tempting ourselves to do something wrong. The same way uh, thought forms, when it becomes super, super strong, especially the astromental thought forms, can also take on a shape of its own for a very, very uh, long time if we've been at it for a while. Okay, so when you are brooding over the same subject, yes, a man may sometimes create a thought form of tremendous power. So we're not saying whether it's negative or positive, but I'm wondering if it is positive, fabulous. You've created a, a, a huge, tremendous uh, a, a PowerPoint for you, which can help you go forward to do and probably manifest this. But if that thought of yours, which you've been going on brooding about, yes, for example, it's about uh, what someone did to you. Say, for example, um, it's a relationship and it's broken off. And you're constantly only thinking about how this person did this to you. How could that person have done this to you? You were so loving. You were so kind, blah, blah, blah. You're brooding over it over and over and over and over again. Can you imagine the power it creates? And you, you start to wonder why this person did this to me. And you keep thinking about it day in and day out when you're sitting on the port, when you're having a shower, when you're eating, when you're riding, driving. In the end, that thought becomes so powerful that you become that person so that you can actually understand why that person behaved and did things 
the way they did. But the problem is in becoming that person, you are going to definitely hurt someone because that person already hurts you. So you have to try and figure out how are we going to work with these thoughts that are created by us? Yes. And um, let me move on now. I'm going to jump a little bit. So they talk about every thought, every thought that we have has a definite character. Yes. So whether it's affection that we have, whether it's hatred, whether they call, uh, they talk about devotion here, whether it's fear or suspicion or anger, pride or jealousy. Yes. Not only creates a form, but also radiates an undulation. So let me make it very easy for you. If you've done psychic self defense, this is what we call the psychic radiatory field. Yes. So it's not just the thought that is very clear about what you are thinking, whether it's love or whether it's devotion. But the thing is with that thought comes what is called a radiatory field that comes out of the person that creates it. So you create not only the form, but also a radiatory field around you. And people can sense this because the radiatory field goes out of you in all directions. It's not just in one direction, like the thought just comes out of you and then goes towards a person. In this case, it is radiating all over you. And that's why Master Chaw calls it the radiatory field, which makes more sense to me. <clears throat> yes, and so thoughts, um, thoughts can be expressed also in the form of color. So the thought form that you have has a form and has a specific color. And so when you look at Master Chaw's book, you will notice that certain colors are associated with, for example, love. There is the beautiful uh, pink, there is also gold, and the shape is that of a flower. Yes, and so when, they, when you see the aura of uh, a person in love, you will see this thought form. And in some cases, if there's an image, you might even see the image of that person floating in that person's aura. And so when you're clairvoyant, you can figure out what's happening. Now, it's not just only positive, yeah? So say, for example, you really dislike this person, that person's image will also be floating in your aura. <laughs> But I'm sure the energy around that, that image may not be very pleasant. Yes. Um, and so the radiation travels in all directions. And if you look at it, uh, when you talk about a particular thought form, there is a difference. And so it says, a radiative field does not, de does not tell you definitely what that person's idea is. It does not allow you to understand what the thought form is but it tends to produce a thought of the same character. Yes. And so, for example, if you are devotional, that's the example given in this book, and you then ooze out this sense of devotion all around you. When you come towards people who have similar sense of devotion, yes, they get affected by your radiatory field. And so their own devotion will also kind of spring up within them. Now, the devotion that you have, for example, maybe my devotion is uh, to the Supreme Being, right? But the pers person who comes near me, he's also devotional, but his devotion is to say uh, the great Allah. And so it's not the same uh, thought form or, or the image that I have towards whom I have the devotion. But because I'm devoted, I'm able to then, within that other person, also evoke the devotion within them towards the person they have devotion to. So it could be a deity, it could be the great being, it could be a guru, it could be anybody. Yes, and so that is what tends to happen with the radiatory field. Any person who habitually thinks pure, good and strong thoughts is utilizing the higher part of the mental body. Yes, and so when we create these thoughts and emotions like we just mentioned a couple of them earlier, love and devotion and service, then the upper part gets overused and starts to, what we spoke about earlier, swell up. The ordinary man, as, is, uh, as his mental body is not entirely developed, yes, so in his mental body, what you would see is completely and sometimes quite different from that of a person who has the power to do good, yes. Great use, uh, and so when, when you have a thought that, say for example, right now, uh, keeping the COVID-19 and you find that there are people going out and doing work and sometimes just hearing their stories, even though they're not physically there, uh, maybe just seeing them on television, if they have that amazing love to do service and help someone, if you have similar vibrations in you, even though it's on the tele television, 
that psychic radiatory field will affect you and you'll say, you know, you know what, I also need to do something. I can't just sit here. I need to do something more to help uh, the present condition. And so it will then again evoke in you similar um, powers of doing good to others. And then you start to serve people around you. Now, um, okay, so say for example, we're talking about Theosophical Society or we're talking about spiritual things. And so when you finish with this talk and you go to a, a space where there are other people, maybe your other family members, you tend to again awaken in them more liberal and higher thoughts. So they will also start thinking, oh, you know, maybe we should think like this because your vibration starts to influence people around you. Now, if you've been in the aura of Grandma Satchua, every time you sit there for a retreat or for a class, by the end of the class, you're like, you know what? I want to do more. Yes, because the teacher is someone who has those amazing positive thoughts uh, and the vibrations are so strong that when you sit in, in his aura, which is usually a couple of meters or in some cases, a couple, couple of kilometers away, when you sit within their aura, you get influenced by what they feel. So the devotion to his guru, for example, Master Cho, when he uh, invokes to the Supreme Being and to his teacher, Lord Mahagaruji Meling, makes you want to become more devotional to Master Cho and his teacher and to God, right? When Master Cho does, starts talking about service and he says, you know, why don't we do this? Inside you, that drive suddenly just gets awakened. You're like, no, I'm going to go and get it done. And you will find ways to get it done. And you will, and if you start to do it more and more, more of similar energies will start to then vibrate within you to come up with new ideas and new plans to further uh, materialize this. Yeah. Okay. And so um, that is with reference to the astral body. Is that uh, more, sorry, that is with reference to the mental body. Is that okay? Is that clear enough to understand? Yes. Any questions? What happens when a person has near-death experience? When a person has near-death near death experience, normally uh, you go out of your physical and etheric body into the astral body. Yes? Now, uh, if that link, remember, you can't have 100% of the soul energy completely come out of the physical body and the etheric body. If it does, then you cannot go back. Yes? But if there's still some energy... For example, your physical permanent seed is still within the physical body, within your heart. Then this, uh, this soul that has gone, most of the energy has gone into the astral body can come back. It's almost like they left, but then they can come back. Yes. And so that's why with, uh, with people who, who treat you um, at surgery, especially the anesthetist, is, is someone who is supposed to be someone who's super alert during the entire operation. He cannot doze off. She cannot doze off because the anesthesia that, that is given to you, my understanding it, it helps the, the soul to move into the astral body during the operation and therefore also reduces the amount of pain and discomfort. But when the astral body uh, and sorry, when the soul energy from the astral body comes back into the physical body, yes, and you start to sense and feel your physical body, then you can start feeling and sensing what's happening. Now, there are cases where uh, even after giving anesthesia, there have been people who can still feel their body being cut. Yes, um, the, the, um, the work that the doctor does or the surgeon does, they can actually see and feel everything. So that, that is a different situation. Sometimes, uh, though they are there, they're still awake on, on some level, not completely out into their astral body. So that does happen. Um, if we can request to all to turn off the video. Okay. All right. Uh, Ma'am, is the forehead chakra in, in intuitive plane or in spiritual? Okay. So the crown chakra is connected to your intuitional world. Remember we said that part of you is actually there. So uh, when we spoke about the three aspects of your divine spark that comes, one rests at the intuitional level. I think that was the second aspect. And therefore that is connected to your intuition. And so your intuition is usually the crown. Yes, higher intuition. This is the lower intuition. So yes, they would be uh, interconnected. So the lower level of the intuitional uh, world would be connected to your forehead and the higher, my guess, would be the crown. 
Okay, so let me see where I have to go. Now, moving on to the astral body, yes? Now, the, uh, the color of the astral body bears the same meaning as when we spoke about the mental body or the causal body. Remember the colors we spoke about earlier in, in the first half of the section? The rose, uh, pink, and we spoke about the blue, the lilac. So similarly, similar colors also have similar meaning in our astral body. So the colors uh, will talk about the feelings, the desires, the emotions that that person creates on a regular basis. For example, uh, brownish red uh, indicates the presence of sens sensuality, black white clouds of malice and hatred, yes. Uh, gray is fear and uh, a darker one of gray uh, with would, would be maybe stronger fear within that person. So the presence of all these different things, for example, irritability is shown as a presence of a number of scarlet flecks. Yes, really bright red flecks within the astral body of a person. Uh, anger, sorry, each representing a small anger impulse. Jealousy is shown by brownish green. Uh, envy is also sometimes also shown as green. Then, uh, the astral body is in the size, uh, in its size and shape described in the ordinary person, again, as an ovoid and the colors are either pleasant or unpleasant, depending on the kind of emotion she or he emotes on a regular basis. Yes. So when the astral body is comparatively uh, quiet, yes. The colors seen, that is the emotions uh, and the habits yielding by that person, this kind of emotion that it shows dominates the entire astral body. So if you have more love and devotion in you, though you have other hues of say a little bit of scarlet red because you get irritable or a bit of jealousy because of certain things, overall, if you're loving and kind, this emotion tends to then superimpose itself in the astral body compared to the others that you and I still have. Yeah. And uh, to move on. Okay, let me try and give you some of these. Because we're almost at the end. I'm trying to see if I can finish. No, I think I have more than 10 pages. Yeah. So uh, if you don't mind, let's just stop, stop here and I'll come to the astral body tomorrow. Uh, which will become easier for you and for me. Because if I start in the middle, uh, I'll break it again. So let me start with the astral body tomorrow. Let me just look at your questions before I end. Um, we have still not found a solution for the earlier videos. Um, I believe Vimeo doesn't really put it on. So um, uh, he's trying to find another option. Yes. What we call mental blocks. Yes, the mental blocks would probably be your prejudice because of which uh, you are unable to see things clearly and you place a block between the way you think and the way another person thinks. Yes, and that is uh, another way of saying mental block. Yes, uh, <laughs> someone loves egg. David, uh, I hope you have some eggs for dinner now. How do we dissociate thoughts and emotions, whether positive or negative? Uh, you, if it's created by you, you can't really disassociate disso disso with them. It's just like your children. You can't just say, okay, you're not my child anymore. Or you're not my children anymore. Uh, if you created that, you will have to bear the consequences of creating such a thought. If it's positive, great, because that positive vibration will help uh, that person. However, if you've been creating negative thoughts and it starts to affect that person, you will be liable for what happens to that person as well. Yeah. So, uh, to try and see that our emotions and thoughts go from the lower level to a higher level. Yes. So the point is to try and practice creating more positive thoughts about yourself, about others. It's not that we are going to become perfect here. It's not possible. So don't worry about making mistakes and creating negative thoughts or negative emotions. It's okay. The point is if you made a mistake, you say, okay, fine, let's erase, move ahead of life. Don't get stuck with it. Don't keep brooding about it. Yeah. And thinking, you know, uh, happens to all of us, especially if you have an old program, you start thinking, oh, I'm such a bad person. I'm not good at this. And you get stuck in that. And that's something that you need to try and get out of. That is that what we were talking about, that hardened thing, 
you need to break that thought and say enough that's it and then allow that energy to then circulate properly without this block inside your mental frame or your mental body okay how come one loves someone and the person doesn't live that person lives Okay, I think the question is, if one person loves the other, how come the other person doesn't love this person? Uh, one is if that person already has a shell because of which they do not allow any kind of influence from outside, especially if they've been broken hearted, they don't want to be hurt again. They don't want positive, negative, anything. <laughs> they just create that block internally. They don't allow it. Secondly, if that person does not, uh, the response of love might be evoked in them, but maybe not towards you. Yes, it might evoke love towards a person that they actually love. And so you trying to create thoughts of love and sending it to someone doesn't necessarily mean that you will get an, uh, a positive opposite response. Yes, it's not necessary. Now remember, um, I'm sure you remember in school and college, you had crushes on you know, classmates or seniors or juniors. Uh, the, the, the young man down the street or the beautiful woman who walked, I still remember because these young boys uh, in, in, my, in our neighborhood, uh, all of us girls had younger brothers, strangely, and the younger brothers had friends. And there was a senior in our school uh, who was uh, quite amazing, actually, the way she walked, she, she would get any head to turn. <laughs> and so these little boys who were what, maybe about seven years younger to her, they would just wait to see her walk down the street. Yes. <laughs> So even though they had this amazing, uh, you know, um, desire to see her, in her case, probably she knew the men and, and maybe even women were trying to look at her. And so she, she would come out and she was always uh, walking in, in an interesting manner that got their attention. Uh, but there are going to be cases where you do like someone down the street or in your class and the response doesn't come back because either they are not interested Yes. And so your, uh, even though your emotion of love got discharged in their aura, there is no response from, in, from that person internally. Right now, similarly, if, even if you have a thought and it's towards a certain person, but that person is so busy doing something. Yes. Then that thought of yours will not affect them because they, that any thought that comes into your aura, which is not yours. Yes. Um, normally tries to find similar vibrations to survive in it. So if this thought has been sent by, say, uh, Mr. D to you, and you are busy because you're on a project, you have work at home, this thought will just hover around you, hoping to find a time to discharge itself. Now, obviously, when you're busy, it cannot, because there is no opening. However, at a weaker point during the day, yes, if your system is weak, then it might come in and try to discharge itself. And if it has uh, similar vibrations within you, it might actually get uh, to do what it wants. Yes, whatever the, the program in that thought is. However, if you do not have any similar thought, now say for example, I walk into um, a restaurant and there is this couple that is drinking and their thought is, you know, drinking is so amazing, everybody should drink, but I do not like drinking. So even though they're exuding thoughts of drinking, even if it comes into my aura, it's not going to find a similar vibration because I don't like to drink. Yes, you give me hot water, I might drink that compared to, to a, a hot drink, right? And so even if it comes, it doesn't find anything within me, uh, even, if, even if it gets discharged and if I'm not feeling uh, really not so good that day. Yeah, so that one. And let's see if there's anything else to stop carry those thoughts to others. Who to stop carry those thoughts to others? You don't have to stop any thought. If you just, you know, you just, you just see someone and you have a thought, oh my God, that person doesn't look good in what he's wearing. It just goes to him. Because it's not just a thought, you're emotionally also adding some material. It'll go straight to that person uh, and it will discharge in their aura. Yes. What do we have to practice to see egg-shaped aura uh, of a person and the layers of the aura? Now, um, most people do have the latent tendency of being clairvoyant, but it takes time. And the ability to also see auras means that your aura has to be super clean so that the chakra through which you're seeing 
has no disturbance within it and you can see clearly through your aura into the other person's aura. Now, yes, auras do have uh, uh, layers. Your chakras have layers. And so to, in case you can't see it, I would suggest start healing more regularly. So when you start using this hand more effectively, the sensitivity of the hand can feel each layer of the aura. And also if there are layers in other parts that you want to scan and check, you can do that. But to develop clairvoyance, there is a course called clairvoyance, but for that you need to finish Arhatic level two. <laughs> yes, okay. Uh, does forgiveness help in transmuting the thoughts astrally from, sorry, astral form sent from another? Well, uh, forgiveness has got to do more for your own healing. Now the person that, or who does not like you might still send negative thoughts towards you. Yes, or um, when they see you, they, they're going to make a face and that might affect you. So if you have done the forgiveness properly and effectively, you have not only asked for healing of yourself, but also healing of that person and also the healing of your relationship. And so when that energy of love, now from hatred or anger, when you start to understand and you forgive and then your energy towards that person starts to change, then if there's a thought that comes from that person, it gets transmuted by your love. Till there comes a point where that person also changes and says, you know what, I think what happened was really stupid. Let's just move on with life. Yes, yeah, so till then it might take time. But yes, if you start to forgive and the love that you send out has a transmuting effect. If you paint that person with golden pink, definitely anything coming out of that person, even before it comes out of their aura is already transmuted. So it doesn't have time to come towards you. How can we get previous sessions? Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping we can work around that. Mental blockages is same when mental retarded people has. No, no, no. Uh, the mental retarded people uh, probably don't have too many blocks, <laughs> at least mental blocks. It's just that their mental ability is rather slow compared to uh, an, an average person. However, mental blocks are within you with reference to certain subjects, with reference to certain persons. Uh, say, for example, someone comes and tells you that Grand Master Choa is so-and-so uh, and uh, the information that you hear is not good. You will automatically have a block saying, no way. Yes, Master Choa cannot be like that. Now, it's, uh, it's not because I think I, I'm just taking Master Choa as an example. He might be the best person you've ever met. But, but someone might tell you that, he, you know, he actually got angry or he did this. Maybe or maybe not. Yes, but if, in that aspect, you need to use discernment. But say, for example, they talk to you about a senior person in the school and they say, you know, this is what's happening. This is what that person is doing. You have to be careful because it's very easy to get caught up in gossip, to get caught up with information that makes you feel so good about talking and having this extra information about the senior person. Yes. And so... Uh, if that information comes and if, if you are, if you really like and say, for example, that person happens to be your instructor, uh, you need to weigh it with what you know about the instructor and what people are saying about the instructor. Maybe it is true. Maybe it's not. Yes, but you have to use discernment before you decide what information is there. Don't put a mental block already. Uh, Master Chua tells us even with teachings, even with the teachings of theosophy or his own teachings or the teachings of Lord Buddha, both Lord Buddha, Many other teachers and Master Chua continues to reiterate it that we should not have a mental block towards these priceless teachings. Have an open mind. So with that, we are able to take more of the information, discern, use our intelligence, evaluate, experiment if possible, and then come to our own conclusion. In that sense, mental block. Yeah. Um, I'm not too sure what this means, Savita. You've written, how does a soul, what is that? W-N-T-E-R. Oh, maybe enter. How does a soul enter another body? Um, the soul of a person who already has a physical body cannot enter into another physical body. Yes. However, there are cases when there are people, oh my God, I think we should stop. Okay. Let me quickly just wind up with this. Um, it, it, it happens when, say for example, they leave their physical bodies permanently and have gone into the astral body and they have certain desires for which they do not have a physical body to satisfy, then they try to find weak physical bodies to try and enter temporarily to uh, hopefully 
enjoy, say for example, they love drinking, they try to enter into a body who's drinking so that they could also enjoy it, but it's not possible for them to stay there for too long. Okay. In blue triangle, are we working on mental body? Yes, of course, thought forms, emotions all come out uh, with the blue triangle. Please continue with your blue triangle. When we bless a person with pink and gold, how does it break the undesirable? It doesn't break it, it transmutes it into positive vibration. So the energy or the vibration that's coming out in the thought form gets uh, transformed into a higher vibration and then doesn't affect anybody. What is vibration and how is it connected to thoughts? Uh, if you remember when we spoke about mental thoughts, the, the thought has a particular uh, vibration or an undulation. And it needs this vibration when it enters into another um, person's mental body or astral body. It needs the same vibration to continue to survive. If there's no similar vibration, it cannot survive. Yeah. So thoughts, emotions also have what is called a certain vibration similar to what we call uh, vibration in the physical world, but much more subtle. Yes, uh, music has a vibration, sound has a vibration, and so uh, different things have different vibrations, yes? If somebody has negative thoughts, whether it will affect us badly? Uh, it can affect you badly when you are in a weak spot uh, or weak point in your life, if it, if it is allowed to enter through your uh, chakras, through your protective web, into your system, only then can it affect you. Otherwise, no. It might stay out. Uh, once its energy is used up, it's out. There are times when you just can't overcome a thought about a person, you practice forgiveness. How does that impact? Well, forgiveness uh, is one part, but every time you think of that person, you need to change the way you think about that person. That is the way to change. Uh, forgiveness is good because it lasts only for a few minutes, but the remaining 18, 16 hours that you're awake, if you're thinking of that person uh, in, an, in, in a dark light, it may not be as effective, yes? What happens if we bless regularly the person who hurt us instead of continuously thinking uh, why they did that? Very good. If you do this, uh, you start thinking positively about that person on a regular basis uh, and blessing the person. The vibration sent to that person changes and slowly starts changing because that vibration will have to go into their aura at some point and starts changing the way they think about you. And life can change both for you and that person. Is there anybody who can see our aura as it can help us know? <laughs> well, you'll have to find a super clairvoyant. Uh, the only clairvoyant I knew was uh, the person who worked with Master Chaw, uh, who is um, Mike Nater or Mung Mike, as we used to call him. He was the best one, but sadly he left his body um, a couple of decades ago. All right. Okay, to the others, I'm going to, wow, there's a lot more coming in. Okay, I'm gonna look at that later. For those of you who need to go have dinner, including me, <laughs> we'll have to look at it. I'm gonna try and see if I can answer that uh, privately. Let's end the session for now. To the Supreme Being, the Divine Father, Divine Mother, to our beloved and respected teacher, Grandmaster Chua Cox, we Lord Maha Guruji Mele, all the invisible and spiritual helpers, healing ministers, healing angels, angels of um, light, love, and power, especially of theosophy, Thank you for your great, great blessings. Thank you for your love, your mercy, for your guidance, for the priceless knowledge and teachings being given to us. Thank you for all the clarity imparted to us. Help us to have greater understanding, make it part of our lives and become better instruments and overcome our own personal limitations and weaknesses. With thanks and in full faith, so be it. Thank you, everybody. Atma Namaste. So officially, I'm going to close this uh, live stream and then i'll answer this for those before i go all right thank you okay now i'm not too sure where we stopped oh wow there's a lot my past my father passed away 1.5 years back due to cancer we couldn't tell him that he had cancer due to the fear of his moral breakdown okay i i still feel the pain and i that i couldn't save him my question, after he passed away, does he have the same feelings of the time he passed away? Also, is there any way I can communicate with him? All right, two things. One is when you leave the physical body and move into the astral body, you're still right here right now. Yes, and everything around you is still the same. And so for them, it's not like they moved on beyond. And so the emotions and thoughts they had just before they left the physical body still remains with them as they move into the astral body. And so how can you communicate with him? 
when you go to sleep in the night, you intend that tonight I would like to talk to my father. So when you go to sleep, you also will move into the astral body. Your father is also in the astral body. Uh, if it is meant to, you may, you will be able to uh, talk to him. Yes. And since you're already writing, he probably knows you want to meet with him. So he might just come. When we bless the person with pink and gold, uh, does it break? Okay, how come I come back here? What happens if the person is full of negative thoughts and hatred, uh, takes alcohol, but do more worship and rituals to God? Well, hopefully with that little bit of uh, ritualistic and prayers that he says to God regularly, some positive vibrations, but they may not be enough for him to overcome his addiction or his so-called uh, lower emotions or thoughts. And so if this person is related to you, if it's a family member, I would recommend start doing pranic psychotherapy on them to help them overcome this. And hopefully the energies of the rituals and prayers and worship will have a better impact on his uh, aura. Crown chakra, forehead chakra, above higher soul level. Yes. Second para says, theosophical ideas affect to a limited people only what... Only what is in that reason for the same. Why can't they impact in similar way in a positive or negative? Uh, well, it, theosophical ideas, <clears throat> because we're talking about <clears throat> on, on higher levels with reference to the mental body, right? Not everybody around you has similar vibrations. And so they may not uh, understand the theosophical ideas, but within them, ideas that are higher than they usually think might get evoked. Yes. Uh, so having an impact usually because the thoughts in theosophy are uh, more higher or more spiritual within them, it might evoke higher ideas, but not necessarily always spiritual. Yes. And they, they might think differently and more positively, but definitely not negative. How do we know whether it's your inner thought or intuition? When it, when it is your inner thought or intuition, you will know. There is no way but to know that this is uh, what's coming. In my dream, I had an experience of facing an earthquake when I visited Kanyakumari in South India to escape that earthquake. I decided to hide underground and I found an ancient sacred book, which I opened and I opened the book and the image of similar Saint, Saint Jeremiah, sorry, Saint Germain with several Egyptian symbols. Does that mean something or some message? Uh, well, uh, these books that you're looking at could be uh, in the uh, astral world It could because when you move into <clears throat> your dream state, you're usually in the astral body. And so maybe you have found some uh, information. And so if there is something about Saint Jeremiah, maybe you can start reading some books on uh, this great saint. Maybe there is some um, information for you there, some message there. And if you remember the Egyptian symbol, so it's preferable when you finish your meditation or, or come out of a, uh, an amazing uh, dream, try and write it down because the details will be there. Maybe you'll rem remember the images and you can start looking for them. How to overcome negative thoughts which uh, come unintentionally? Uh, nothing comes unintentionally. Uh, it's got to do with the way you have been subconsciously creating these thoughts. And so using the blue triangle, using inner reflection firm resolution is one great way to overcome this. Telepathy, yes, is connected. That has got to do with the mental, uh, the ability to send a thought and the other person to catch the thought as it is and understand what the thought is. So the message, if you've sent an image of an apple, the person should have received the image of the apple. Does uh, transmuting shield make it make any difference? Yes, it will. Uh, it will transmute the energies that are coming towards you that is negative, which is positive, will already come through. How long does the love thought hover around? <laughs> it depends on the amount of love energy you've put into the thought to go and hover around anybody. Uh, but some instructions spoil the reputation of other, so, sorry, some instructors spoil the reputation of other instructors, maybe to get their organizers. Now, if, if it is personal like this, um, I would say you've got to remember, nothing can happen to you if you haven't done this to someone. So if people are saying things to spoil your reputation or to take away your organizers, it's happening only because you have done the same to someone in the past. It's just your lesson trying to catch up with you right now. So you need to figure out what you want to do with that. How did Shankaracharya enter the body of a king when he was questioned about uh, sex? 
I'm sorry, I do not know about the story to give you any idea. Um, sorry, Savita. Okay. Um, Now, uh, the Clairvoyance course is usually organized uh, maybe once in two years or so. I'm not too sure if we had to have some, I don't think we're having one this year, so maybe next year. So look at the schedule under worldpranahealing.com. If there's a, a Clairvoyance course anywhere, it's usually only at the ashram. Uh, you're definitely welcome to attend it if you finish Arhatik Yoga Level 2, yeah, not Prep 2. Okay, thank you, thank you. There's nothing more. <laughs> okay. If somebody left their physical body several years back, is it possible to communicate with them? Of course you can, because they live in the astral world for quite a big, uh, quite a long time. So they will still be there, even if they left some time ago. Um. Poco, uh, if you're talking about your daughter, if she's no longer in the body, you can still connect to her the same way I spoke about uh, the, the other person uh, that uh, the earlier participant wanted to meet. Yeah, at night, make an intention to meet with her. All right, people, that's it. Thank you. Good night. Have a wonderful dinner. Uh, I can't believe it. 183 of you are still there. Anyway, thank you. Atma Namaste. I'll see you tomorrow at 6.30. And uh, we'll continue with this topic. I'm hoping I will finish it. This is the first time I haven't finished a chapter in one sitting, <laughs> in one session. It's taken going to be three. Thank you so much. Take care and we'll see you tomorrow. Much love.